For the last four months, my editing experience on the Mac Studio has been pretty darn great. Even with some of those annoying transition and sound library bugs we got in the Final Cut Pro 10.6.3 update. Luckily, the Pro Apps team at Apple cranked out 10.6.4 with some bug fixes in about a month. So those obstacles were a bit annoying, but that's not the fault of the Mac Studio. Now, my Mac Studio, by the way, is the base M1 Max with 64 gigabytes of unified memory and a two terabyte SSD. And it chews through all the footage I throw at it, no problem. And I'm excited to throw even more codecs and resolutions at it to really see what it's capable of. So far, it's mostly dealt with Canon codecs, XFAVC and H.264 in 4K from my C300 Mark II and my EOS R. I'd love to see how it handles higher resolutions and some raw formats, all of that, of course, in due time. I will say, though, that I have had some issues with choppy playback, lag, and dropped frames, but I'll touch on that more in depth in a moment, so stick around. Now, with my old setup with my 2013 quad-core Mac Pro, I was editing off of my 21 terabyte Promise Pegasus 2 R8, which was fine, plenty fast for real-time playback, and obviously well-equipped when it comes to storing a ton of footage from client projects, short films, and YouTube content. But I wanted to be sure that I took full advantage of the Mac Studio's screaming fast data rates for the two terabyte and higher internal SSDs, 7.4 gigabytes per second. Now this wouldn't cause me to notice much of a difference in playing back my usual 4K footage, but it would give me a big advantage when exporting my videos out of Final Cut Pro. I've got a link in the description to an excellent article over on fcp.co where Peter Wiggins does some intensive testing of the Mac Studio and finds out that it exports faster to its internal SSD than to some of the fastest external storage options. And the differences are significant, so definitely check out that article to learn more. With the Mac Studio, I'm editing exclusively from the internal two terabyte drive, and that was by design. If I really had my way, I would have gotten the four terabyte internal SSD, but the two terabyte was better for the bottom line, and I knew that my on average 100 gigabyte YouTube projects would be fine paired with the two terabyte SSD. And they have been, so there's no complaints there. But let's talk a little bit more about export times. The biggest pain point Point for me with my old setup, the 2013 quad core Mac Pro, was export time. A 12 ish minute 4K YouTube video would take, on average, around three hours to export. My new Mac Studio, 15 minutes or less usually, often in real time. This alone has made the $3,000 investment beyond worth it. And this factor alone is what got me to stop enduring both of my aging 2013 Macs and go back into debt to the tune of almost $6,000, interest-free for 12 months with my Apple card, of course. Thanks, Apple. My channel, my business, I was suffering with these ridiculously long export times. It was giving me a lot of anxiety. It made my Mac Pro unusable while it exported a video, and if there was a big enough glitch or mistake in an exported video, having to re-export would push my ability to publish a video from one day to the next. And that, for a YouTuber, can really be devastating. The Mac Studio took away every single one of those pain points, but let's talk a little bit more about connectivity. Connectivity is one of the huge differences between the 2013 Mac Pro and the new Mac Studio, and it should be. One Mac is a high-end Pro computer, while the other, the Mac Studio, is really something that falls in the middle of a Mac Pro and a Mac Mini. The 2013 Mac Pro has six Thunderbolt ports and four USB-A ports, while the Mac Studio only has four Thunderbolt ports, two USB-A ports, and two USB-C ports, which are on the front. So with all of the peripherals I have in my edit bay, the Mac Studio is max out on ports. So much so that I have to use a USB-A hub and the USB ports on my Thunderbolt displays to connect all of my devices and accessories. Fortunately, I haven't had any issues with the connectivity. All of my edit bay accessories like my Monogram Master Console, my USB-A 3.0 hub, my iPhone charger, my two iPad minis, and my hard drive dock all have stable connections. And my monitors, three that connect via Thunderbolt and one via HDMI, all work perfectly with the Mac Studio. But it does have the absolute bare minimum amount of ports I need to run all of these peripherals. That's why the M1 Mac Mini wasn't an option for me when it came out. I had to hold out hope that Apple would release a Mac Pro Mini or a Mac Mini Pro. And basically they did, so lucky me, and lucky us. And lucky us that we finally got an SD card slot on 
on a desktop, one that we can easily get to on the front of the computer, not the back like the iMac and Mac Mini. Now, most of my footage for my channel is shot on my C300 Mark II, so I'm having to use a CFast 2.0 card reader that's connected to an open Thunderbolt port on the back of one of my Thunderbolt displays. But I do take a lot of photos and sometimes vlog or shoot B-roll with the EOS R, and that SD card slot in the front is incredibly convenient. Does it work perfectly? No, like all Apple SD card slots, it sure doesn't. I'd say maybe half the time it mounts when I insert it for the first time, the other times I have to remove it and reinsert it to get it to mount, just like on my MacBook Pro and pretty much every Mac I've had that has an SD card slot. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it just is something all of us Apple users will continue to grumble about, but ultimately accept because we don't really have a choice. So what has been my biggest issue with the Mac Studio in the last four months? It's the lag. It's the choppiness, it's the drop frames, and the crashes. Fortunately, the Mac Studio isn't to blame. It's third-party plugins for Final Cut Pro, and specifically third-party plugins that aren't yet optimized for Apple Silicon. They're relying on Rosetta to run, and in some more intensive editing sessions, it really shows. I've had a few plugins pop up with a not responding dialog box, and I've had to either restart Final Cut or restart my computer to resolve it. It's just infrequent enough to not be mad at it, but I'm close sometimes to going mad with a few of these plugins. So if you've been experiencing any issues with playback in Final Cut Pro on your M-powered Mac, this is most likely the issue because these machines have plenty of power to play back 4K footage with a bunch of effects on them. But the more plugins we use that are relying on Rosetta, the more vulnerable we are to Final Cut and plugin crashes. Again, so far this has been a relatively minor inconvenience while editing, but it would be awesome if these plugin makers could get their software optimized for Apple Silicon. I'd really love to see what Final Cut is like when everything is working as it should. Now there's one more thing I want to touch on to wrap up this review, and I'll admit it's a bit strange because it's love. With the Mac Studio, there's been this feeling like there's something missing in my relationship with it. Something that isn't missing with my new 14-inch MacBook Pro. For all of you hardcore Apple fans, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm just not experiencing the depth of emotion, the love for my Mac Studio that I've experienced with my new MacBook Pro. <laughs> Because it's a desktop computer and I can only use it in my edit bay, there's not as much of a personal connection to it like there is with my MacBook Pro. The Mac Studio also suffers because it's performing as expected, having used the MacBook Pro for the last six plus months. The MacBook Pro was there first. It rescued me from the pain and misery of Intel, so when the Mac Studio came into the mix, all of the emotion I experienced from transitioning from Intel to M1 was focused on the MacBook Pro. And with the MacBook Pro, I can take it virtually anywhere, the coffee shop, on the plane, on set, on the couch. I can hold it, I have to clean it, I need to keep it alive by charging the battery. All of these points of contact, all of these interactions, create a deeper connection to it. Again, it's weird, I know, but I've asked myself over and over again why I'm not as amped about the Mac Studio, why I find myself wanting to work away from the studio when I'm not doing intensive video editing, why I find myself drawn to the MacBook Pro so much more than the Mac Studio. And instead of looking forward to a day's work in my studio, I'm constantly craving getting out in the world to get my work done. And I think this is why so many of you choose to work off only a notebook. Not only is it more affordable, but it can really do it all. You you can work at a coffee shop or hook up at home to a monitor and make the computer act like a desktop. I think if I had a simpler edit bay with fewer monitors and hard drives, I'd strongly consider docking my notebook and using it exclusively. But the reality is that I am, for the bulk of my time, creating content. I'm editing. I'm in the edit bay, chopping that broccoli, and throwing down 10-bit 4K footage, effects, transitions, titles, and for my comfort, for ergonomics, for efficiency and speed, I need to be in my edit bay working with a desktop computer configuration. And for me and my work, the Mac Studio is the best tool for that. Maybe not perfect, but I do have zero regrets about buying it. I just kind of wish I loved it like I love my 14-inch MacBook Pro. But I don't, and that's okay. If you own or are thinking about buying a Mac Studio, you might want to check out my other two videos about this awesome new Mac. I've got one vid that's an in-depth tour of my desk setup, and another that goes into how I installed and set up my Mac Studio when I first got it. You can click on either of those videos here. Thanks for watching, everyone. Until the next one, I'll see you all soon and remember keep chopping that broccoli